It's right stunning right. how quickly this law was flouted. People and I think it has to do with the sense that they weren't really absolutely sure going in of what they were going into. That the variety of interpretations of what prohibition meant varied. So that you had people thinking you might even have beer and wine and you might have this and you might have that. And all of a sudden you have the most draconian law, the Volstead Act. And that's going to, I think, it's one of the first examples of the, the absolute that then produces the unintended consequence of just instantaneous right. disregard for the law. I had written a book that was about New York in the 20s and 30s, and I wrote a chapter about how the uh, Rockefeller family in, in building Rockefeller Center had to acquire the rights of 228 pieces of land. That was the middle of the speakeasy belt in Manhattan in the mid-20s. This is 1926. Between 5th and 6th. 5th and 6th, between the, 48th the, and 51st Street. And, um, and I went to the city records, and there I go again, sneezing from the, from the dust, from my allergies, but spent a lot of time in the basement of the municipal records building and found these records of the speakeasy owners, uh, whom the Rockefellers had to pay a lot more than they paid to other people because the spe speakeasy owners had more political clout than the Rockefeller family. So, you know, how is it that this bar owner, one of them was John Houston's father, right. father actually, you know, why does he have so much power? And then you realize, you, know, you think about prohibition, and you know the, the, the public officials and the, the police officers that he is either paying off or who is friends, and you begin to understand it. So you stop and think about prohibition for more than 60 seconds, really think about it, and you say, holy cow. How is it possible? How the hell did that happen? Which is what I wanted to call the book, but they wouldn't <laughs> let me. Um, so I began to work on it, and uh, I think I ran into you on the Brooklyn Bridge. You did, you yeah. did. I was pushing my then newborn Little gal, and uh, you said we have to. You have to. You're, I know what your next film is. Is what you said. That's what I said. And <laughs> and and we had already we already knew what our next three films were. But your arguments were compelling enough that we actually then put it in yeah. right into that. You know, and then Lynn and I started talking about it immediately. A long, long talks about it because it's really interesting stuff. It is really. It was such a eureka moment to find that there's a subject you, you think you should know and you don't know anything about, and then you sort of it's almost unavoidable to. You have to go there. I just felt like, wow, I, I don't know enough about this, and I, I, I need to know it. And so, it's and not it's, like it's the Federal Reserve Bank, I mean, or no, the International well, Monetary. This is about something that's really interesting. It's exactly, and there's tremendous and, 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 amount of humor. Also, you know that you have an idea of prohibition, and it's Model T's careening around rain Chicago streets, and. Tommy guns blasting, and then all of a sudden you find out that it has many, many more dimensions. And finding out about the anti saloon league and the single issue campaigns there, the demonization of the immigrants, the, the smear campaigns, particularly in the 1928 election against Al Smith, and so reminiscent of other things. Um, the Tea Party is sort of there as well, makes an appearance in, in the sense that people felt they were losing control of their country and wanted to no, I, I, take it back. I think the Tea Party is in it and every other political trend that we have today, yeah. and the, the, the war between the rich and the poor, between the city and the country, between the, uh, the people who um, you know, well established in the culture and those who are trying to establish themselves in the culture. The good news to me is that it reminds me that uh, these two, these things shall pass. <laughs> it reminds me that these Lay things off. shall also pass. Yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh, I don't know. There were so many great stories that we discovered that I had known nothing about and so many great characters that I'd never heard of. And I think I know American history pretty well. I mean, I've been making films about American history for a long time and reading a lot and I studied in school and yet this era was a complete blank. Yeah. I mean, not the era, the 20s I knew, and that's why I thought that's I knew right. Prohibition. You know, it's, it's in, mo yeah, in most high school textbooks or college textbooks, it's a paragraph, it's a paragraph or a sentence. I mean, yeah. it's kind of just skipped past. But, but all the things, though, it, it, you almost want to go back in time to remember exactly what you didn't know as you began the project. <laughs> because Carrie Nation has dimension. Carrie Nation's life was filled with tragedy. Her mother died in an insane asylum, convinced she was Queen Victoria. Her first husband drank himself to death. A second unhappy marriage would end in divorce. She determined to give herself over to the struggle against what she called the place where the serpent drink crushed the hopes of my early years, the saloon. Kansas had already banned the sale of alcohol in every one of its 105 counties. But the state's dusty cow towns and large cities alike were filled with thirsty men, and no one paid much attention to the law. 
As president of the Barber County WCTU, Cary Nation had led peaceful marches that had had little effect, wrote letters to legislators and lawmen that were never even answered, and eventually became convinced God wished her to do more. On the 6th of June, 1900, before retiring, I threw myself downward at the foot of my bed and told the Lord to use me in any way to suppress the dreadful curse of liquor. I told him I wished I had a thousand lives, that I would give him all of them. And I wanted him to make it known to me some way. The next morning, before I awoke, I heard these words very distinctly. Go to Kiowa, and I'll stand by you. The next morning, with an armload of what she called smashers, rocks and bottles wrapped in paper to look like harmless packages, she strode into a saloon in Kiowa. I told the owner, Mr. Dobson, get out of the way. I don't want to strike you, but I'm going to break up this den of ice. I began to throw at the mirror and the bottles below the mirror. Mr. Dobson and his companion jumped into a corner, seemed very much terrified. From that, I went to another saloon until I had destroyed three. The other dive keepers closed up, stood in front of their places, and would not let me in. By this time, the streets were crowded with people. One boy, about 15 years old, seemed perfectly wild with joy. I have since thought of that being a significant sign. For to smash saloons will save the boy. Did you say dementia or dementia? <laughs> <laughs> okay, exactly. Well, I was going to start with dementia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but now that you dimension it, I would also add dementia to the, yeah. to the list of her attributes. But that you get to know something about Francis Willard that adds something to this story. That you discover people that you've never heard of, like Wayne Wheeler of the Anti-Saloon League, or get to understand Mabel Walker Willebrand, who, mm -hmm. I mean, you say it in the film that she's as important as uh, at that time as Sandra Day O'Connor, and or or as well known as well known and as, that, well as known. influential. And in the culture, idea absolutely. that that we could have gone through all of these films that passed through the twenties many times, and she's not oh, there. I and all the other people, Pauline Sabin, who becomes a woman opposed to. I'm in love with Pauline. Sabin. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah. right. She's, she's my hero. Totally. Yeah. yeah. It's also striking, I think, that that uh, if I imagine myself being alive in that period, I say, well, I would have been for the income tax. I would have been for women getting the vote. I yeah. would have been for improving the lot of the immigrant poor. Therefore, put those three things together, I might well have been a prohibitionist. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is so totally counterintuitive. Yeah, I agree completely. I, and somebody asked me that, would you have been for it? And I said, you know, no, but then I'm just speaking from today mm -hmm. uh, and the hindsight of that. And, and yet I would have been involved in all the host of progressive causes. And it would have been hard to disentangle, particularly since one of the earliest along with emancipation, abolition and emancipation, is, is temperance. And it's also true since we hadn't done it yet, we didn't quite know how it's going to turn out. Right. So if you put yourself back in 1915, maybe it would make sense. Or maybe I'm worried that I would perhaps fall into the category of it's a good idea, but I won't have to follow it. I mean, I think for a lot of people, that's what I think shocked me the most. And I don't know why I shouldn't have been shocked at the hypocrisy of so many of the people who supported it. You shouldn't have been shocked. I shouldn't have been shocked. <laughs> yeah. But I was. I was. I remember calling you and saying, I don't get it. How could they vote for it when they knew they weren't going to obey it? And, you know, yeah, that's yeah, how it But I don't think we would have been part of that saloon culture. Right? We now have a relationship to alcohol, and we right. assume that we do it responsibly, and it's within some sort of parameters. But we would not have been in the buckets of blood. Uh, we would have been... Well, I was a well, newspaper man, so I would have been in the buckets of blood. Okay, so ex yeah, besides my, I don't know, my grandfather was on the Lower East Side, like back then. I would have maybe been yeah. a recent immigrant. I don't know. I'm not sure. I wouldn't be who I am. Well, I mean, all the benefits. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I come from Episcopal and Methodist stock in the mountains. <laughs> it wouldn't have been of in the saloon. No, but it was the mountains of Virginia, so we had. <laughs> you were making your own. We were making it. We yeah. were we were good manufacturers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that wouldn't have been a problem. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have wouldn't have mattered one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the very first things that happens in Seattle during Prohibition that, that uh, I guess this didn't make it into the film. But there was actually a convention here in 1922 of, of bootleggers right. from the Northwest where they were operating under Robert's Rules of Orders. Uh, how are they going to conduct the meeting that will determine how they're going to divide up territory and make their money in the bootlegging business? It was very, very well behaved. 
Well, the thing we gravitated to, of course, was Roy Olmsted, the baby-faced police lieutenant who's sort of bootlegging on the side and gets caught and fired and then turns himself into the king of Puget Sound bootleggers. But a whole different brand. I mean, we've got Capone, we've got uh, George Remus, another unknown story elsewhere, but there's something really compelling about the story of, uh, of Olmsted. He's, he's compelling, he's attractive, he's, he's not diluting the booze, it's the finest. And the proximity to Canada permits them and this porous sound uh, and with all its islands permits the offloading, the transshipment of all this uh, fine Canadian whiskey and he's uh, satisfying the um, needs of the clientele from William F. Boeing, the aviation pioneer, on down. On March 22, 1920, two months after Prohibition went into effect, at an isolated dock a few miles north of Seattle, Washington, Eleven men labored to load sacks of Canadian whiskey from a speed launch into six waiting automobiles. They didn't seem to have a care in the world. But when the little convoy started up the steep road that led inland, they found their route blocked by a dozen federal prohibition agents who opened fire. Two cars managed to roar around the blockade. The agents recognized one driver as he hurtled past and arrested him at his home the following afternoon. He was himself a lawman, the youngest and most promising lieutenant on the Seattle police force, Roy Olmsted. He had a wife and children and a personality so pleasing he was called the baby lieutenant. Olmsted was fired from the force, pled guilty to a federal charge, paid a $500 fine, and then was free to go, able now to devote himself full-time to becoming the king of the Puget Sound bootleggers. As a police officer, Olmsted had seen firsthand how disorganized most of the small-time liquor smugglers trying to take advantage of prohibition were he knew he could do better. With financing from 11 silent partners, he hired bookkeepers, dispatchers, warehousemen, lawyers, sailors, truck drivers, so many men that he became one of the biggest employers in the Seattle area. Olmsted also recruited a few trusted friends from the police department, including a young stenographer named Edwin Hunt. Roy Olmsted handpicked everybody. He picked people who were good at what they did. And Dad was his close advisor. But Roy was the boss. And everybody looked up to Roy and liked him. They were well paid and they were very good at what they did. Olmsted's illicit cargo, brought down by boat from Canada, where alcohol was still legal, was unloaded on tiny Darcy Island as many as 4,000 sacks at a time, and stored until the next stormy night when Olmsted's fleet of small, swift vessels could transfer it to one or another of the wooded beaches that lined Puget Sound. Yeah, and, and there really wasn't that much of a Coast Guard presence, so they pretty much had free reign. I mean, there were some boats out there, but they could go wherever they wanted, basically, in the fog. It was pretty much tailor-made for bootlegging. But I hadn't realized that Seattle was kind of wide open before Prohibition started. There wasn't a lot of um, concern about vice, whatever you want to call it, back then before, so that the city was ripe for uh, prohibition to. When you're take cutting over. down trees for a living, which is a really <laughs> tough right. job, yes. and you're trying to get them to market, and you're skidding them down roads, you have a skid row, just like you're going to have a tenderloin in New York and a and a levee in, in some place in a, you know, Storyville and all of the districts uh, around the country where the inner cities are breeding that kind of thirst. The Canadian a aspect is interesting because it's something that I certainly didn't know is that there was prohibition in most of Protestant Canada. Quebec never had prohibition, but all the other provinces did one time or another, including British Columbia. But it had, it, it had been moderated sufficiently by the time that American prohibition came in that they were able to do a lot of shipment down from there. 
Uh, the, you know, the words of Roy, Roy Haynes, the first prohibition, the second prohibition commissioner, said, you can't keep liquor from dripping through a dotted line, which I thought was a good description of <laughs> the Canadian <laughs> circumstance. Was it actually not against the law for Canadians to ship alcohol to the United States? Well, it, in, in the early years Absolutely. it wasn't. It was 1930 that they finally uh, uh, tried to stop it. A little bit late. The cows were long and out of the And then it was too late. Yeah, so all exactly. through the 20s it was not illegal to s ship alcohol what, to... What was illegal was to ship it without paying an export duty, which right. of course they all did, which is the way that they finally got caught at the end of Prohibition. <laughs> I think it's partly a function of just anxiety and fear that people have that there's change is happening or that they don't they feel unsettled and frightened and so they look outward to things to blame for that and that seemed to be happening now we're living very uncertain times and it's really scary what might be happening in the future whether it's terrorism or the economy or lack of jobs or whatever and you want to blame somebody else for that and that was prohibition and it feels like yeah. with you know urbanization and, and the, the, the sort of volcanic changes happening in American society and the blame went to immigrants for causing problems. Yeah, 1920 you know, was the year when the population went from being more urban, rural than urban to more urban than rural. Right, and it's just fear the, of the unknown, fear of change. The great arrogance of the present is we think we know more, right. that we, because we've survived and they haven't, <laughs> that they didn't live the way we did, that they didn't experience the things that we've experienced, it's the conversations that we had, mm -hmm. the loves, the jealousies that we felt, and what's so clear in Prohibition is how just contemporary it feels. Forget about even the, the political aspects to it, the social, but just the human dimensions of being told you can't have something and therefore wanting it more. This sort of release of energy that takes place that coincides after the First World War and the end of that fighting and the beginning of the Jazz Age and the economic boom that's happening in the country and this strange other thing. Go, it's like going in the wrong direction is prohibition and, and you just sort of ignore it and you keep going and we understand that impulse um, and we also understand all of the things how it could have come into place because we've seen it right. in our own time some way or another and which as you say that the strange and the other in tough times it's very easy to create prohibition for somebody else. You can also see a lot, obviously, in the end of prohibition, how it ended and why it ended uh, in today's politics. And, and I think that it's clear from the film, and I hope from my book, that the real thing that brought the end of prohibition was the depression because of the sudden loss of tax revenue. Income tax revenue uh, was down by 33%. Uh, the capital gains tax revenue disappeared entirely for four years. The government needed money. Where can we get money? Bring back liquor and there'll be taxation uh, from it. And then you think about today's circumstances when nobody wants to pay taxes. I think that if and when marijuana becomes legal and regulated, it'll be because of taxes. People don't want to yeah. pay taxes. Let the guy who's smoking his marijuana pay the taxes. It felt also with the parallel of the depression that there was kind of a sense of you know, we have bigger fish to fry. We have more important right. problems to worry yeah, about. Really be Is this really the priority this, yeah. that our government should be focusing on when, you know, a quarter of the population is out of work? Right. And we sort of have this very severe economic crisis now. I think it puts in perspective some of the kind of hot button values issues that were, you know, so important in the 2004 the, I, I, election I really don't matter now because we've got exactly, much more serious exactly. matters the to focus on. Exactly. The tipping point is the depression, but it's that developing sense of the hypocrisy yeah, of this yeah. misapplied yeah. law and the fact that so many people can flaunt it. So many, be, so many politicians are saying one thing out of one side of their mouth and drinking something Shocking. else <laughs> out of the other yeah. side of their mouth. Yeah. Um, and that's that's to me, and then a depression comes along, and, and the fact that you may be missing not just the taxation, but the jobs that come along with what was the fifth largest industry, if you add in the Teamsters and the barrel makers and right. all of it those. Was a, it was a jobs program to, yeah. bring, to bring back liquor, yeah. beer, and wine. Absolutely. So, socialism. Yeah. Ah, that's <laughs> You think there could have been prohibition without the women's suffrage movement? It seems as impossible to imagine how the whole thing could have happened without women getting motivated and uh, energized to do something about their lives, make their lives better. I certainly hadn't understood that dimension at all. And I think that scene in episode one where the women in Ohio go out and pray and march, having, you know, never done, women in America had never done anything like that as a group in that way on their own without men to actually have agency. It didn't totally work in that, you know, after a while, moral authority wasn't enough. but that sense that they had a higher purpose outside their home to do something for the greater good. 
It's pretty powerful. But it's just, it, yeah, but it's, it represents a pent up frustration on the right. part of women. When you live in a country that has proclaimed that all men are created equal, where you've declared universal rights and you have right. none, not to your children, right. not to you know any matters of divorce, right. nothing. And we're not talking about the vote. The vote is this incredibly radical, far off right. thing well, that you can imagine. It's a problem with the other issues that it's, they that realize that we can't fix those without, without getting, without the, vote. getting yeah. the vote. So comes right. you know marital rape, all of these things. If you're if you left an unhappy marriage, you left with the clothes on your back. Right. You didn't have any right. rights exactly. to the children, to the money. Even if you were widowed, the money went to the sons of the husband. I mean, there were women had no rights whatsoever. No, maybe stories of the early suffragists who, you know, they suffered themselves from this experience of having the husband who disappears with the money or who loses right. his job because he's drunk, who comes home, you know, brings home a venereal disease from the brothel that's attached to the saloon. It was really, really awful. And they you know, had Susan, no recourse yeah, at all. Su Susan B. Anthony began her career in public life at, the, at a convention of the New York State Sons of Temperance as a temperance worker, and she wanted to give a speech uh, to, to, to the uh, assembled uh, um, delegates, and the guy in charge said, "No, you can't do that. The men are, the brothers are here to talk. The sisters are here to listen." She said, "This doesn't work. I have to do something about it." And she switched her campaign from temperance to suffrage, yeah. and, for, and, for, and first formed her own temperance society, yep. made up only of women. Men could come, but they couldn't vote or talk. Right. Where did she get that yeah. idea? Yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, no, it's it, it's yeah. a good story, and it's women all the way along exactly. the line. And as our film begins. Um, we begin with that most painful and intimate of things of a mm -hmm. woman appealing to the only uh, voice she can go to, which is her pastor, and say, my husband has lost his way to drink and everything has fallen apart. And that's what galvanizes at least Lyman right. Beecher to make the speeches, which makes temperance a much, right. and it puts it temperance yeah, on everyone's makes personal. Tongue. Yeah, and the, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union, they, came, they campaigned what they call home protection. To them, it was entirely an issue of protecting the family from the ravages of alcohol. And alcohol was pretty ravaging. Yeah, and, and, and that, that's the thing that I think everybody forgets and, I, and I'm glad that we we begin and we end uh, with the constant reminder of of its toll mm -hmm. because it, it, it's fun to make light of the folly of prohibition in retrospect right. uh, and it's so interesting that as women develop in this story not just uh, being central at the beginning but throughout in Carrie Nation and Francis Willard and and Mabel Walker Willebrandt in, in prosecuting it in Pauline Sabin and saying no in the young daughters who are you know, flaunting the law in the speakeasies, uh, it's, it's in some ways really a woman's story. Yeah, I, I, one, there are many good things that came out of Prohibition, faster speedboats, you know. <laughs> I guess the FBI is not, depends what your perspective is, whether that's a good thing, but uh, I think that one of the really good things that came out of <laughs> Prohibition was here we are, men and women in a bar together, never happened before, pro right. before Prohibition. The saloons were male only and women weren't allowed, they wouldn't think of going into saloons and then once you get rid of the law and the speakeasy, this illegal place, well then we had to change social habits as well. Of course they get there and there's no bathroom for the women. No, these were all all male places. So, the guy who runs the place figures out, oh yeah, there's that room closet over there, or underneath the, behind the bar, or under the stairway. Get a little room, you put in a, a toilet, a sink, and a mirror, and it's the powder room. It gives us the powder room. This is an amazing step forward for American society. <laughs> Brought to us by prohibition. Brought by prohibition. There was this incredible moment that anybody who's doing research, who's doing historical research, you stumble across something that nobody's had before. And, and it was in the uh, Hagley Library in Wilmington where the DuPont family has kept right. all their documents for, for generations, even centuries. And the uh, DuPont family, of course, financed the repeal movement. And there were the accusation made by Dries that they were doing it not for the reasons they said in, uh, said in public, which were about, you know, we need the tax revenue or government's intruding in our lives or it's an abrogation of states' rights. The Dries uh, argued that they were doing it to protect their own financial interests. And, of course, the wet historians have always said, well, not really, there's no evidence of that. And I'm going through these papers of Pierre Dupont, thousands and thousands of papers. I'm sneezing because I'm allergic to dust, but I've got to do this for the, for, uh, for the book, for the research. And I find this letter from Pierre Dupont to his brother Lamont that says, and if we can get rid of bring the 18th Amendment, if we can bring back liquor, we will be able to get rid of both the income tax, the personal income tax, and the corporate income tax. I said, Eureka, I've got it. <laughs> Your smoking gun right yeah, there. Fantastic. Um, we had so many 
interesting moments bring on the film, but I think finding some of the old people who remembered it was really interesting yeah. because it made it kind of come alive in a way that when you read about in a book, no matter how great the book, it's just it's having a person tell you, I remember what it was like to go to an, a speakeasy with my boyfriend and order something and how cool it was that you had to have a password and it was so exciting and, you know, just a little bit of the romance of it. Was or really or accompanying your father to the United States Capitol right. uh, to sell uh, to yeah. sell bottles to the senators or the congressmen, depending on which way you turn, and then coming out and counting the hundred dollar bills that you'd collected, and when you were tipped off because you'd paid off the local cop that a raid was going to come to your right. still, you called up your uncle who brought the hearse and took you to uh, Arlington National Cemetery where nobody would. Uh, just think of disturbing a soldier. I mean, these are the, that's the, the icing on the cake. Another great moment for me, something that, that wouldn't have worked for the film, <clears throat> but it's the last sentence of the book. Um, I found in, uh, an interview that was conducted by Fortune Magazine with Sam Bronfman of the, of the Seagram Distillery, huge bootlegger, exporter from Canada into the U.S. Of, of, of liquor during Prohibition, made the family fortune, made him a billionaire uh, in time. Uh, I found in, in the files of Fortune magazine, this never made into the magazine, the transcript of the original interview. And these two reporters are interviewing Mr. Sam, as he was called, at his estate overlooking the Hudson in Westchester County, New York. And he keeps on evading them, says, no, we had nothing to do with prohibition. Everything we did was legal. And this goes on. And then finally, at the end, he goes for a swim in the pool, gets out, he towels himself off, puts on a sports shirt, and he sits down with the two reporters. And he says, you know, about this prohibition thing that you've been asking me about, there's something I've got to tell you. Reporters lean forward and says, "You people were thirsty," and I thought that pretty much tells the story. <laughs> I'll drink to that. Uh.